So uh, like I said, we're going to be talking about sensible salting today, and uh, we've got a great lineup of speakers. So we're really going to be covering the full gamut of this issue. Uh, so I, like I said, I'll be talking about uh, water resources uh, and uh, sensible salting. Uh, then Jennifer Hammer is with the Conservation Foundation and the Salt Smart uh, Collaborative, and she'll be talking about a training and certification program that is being developed. And I really think this is going to help transform how parking lots and sidewalks are managed in the future. And then we'll have John LinkedIn, who's with LinkedIn Group, uh, uh, talk about uh, how he's integrated. Uh, he and his uh, team has, have integrated sensible salting into their uh, work, uh, how it actually helps uh, from a business model standpoint, as well as helping uh, maintain safety and uh, reducing our uh, impact on the environment. And then we'll go outside for a demonstration. So people attending today, you guys are really going to have a solid understanding of what the issues are and what the solutions are. Um, and uh, I think you know you guys will really have a, uh, a solid understanding moving forward. So, um, like I said, we're gonna. Uh, I'll start off, um, and we're gonna be talking about the relationship between our use of uh, salt and deicers and our water resources. And it's uh, important to emphasize that what you guys do in the winter time, as far as winter snow and ice management, is critical. You guys really save lives. Uh, you maintain economic development, uh, commerce throughout the winter. I mean, what you guys do is important. So we live on a blue planet where about 75% uh, uh, of the Earth's surface is covered with water, but most of that is salt water. Only about 2.5% of all water in the air, on the land, or in the ground is actually fresh water. And most of that is locked up in our ice caps. So about 70% of all that fresh water is locked up in the ice caps. When it melts, it goes into the oceans and becomes salt water. Most of the remaining 30% is actually either too deep or not clean enough for us to use. And what this all comes down to is about 0.007% of all the water on the planet is uh, available for us to use. And we need to share that water with a lot of other species and a lot of other people. So it took 200,000 years for the first billion people to show up on the planet, but only 200 years for the next 7 billion people. This year, we're going to have 8 billion people on the planet, all needing to share that 0.007% of water. And unfortunately, our actions are polluting that water. Um, and that includes our use of road salt. Water is necessary for all living things. Whether you're in the tropics, the tundra, or the Midwest, water is necessary for all living things. It's also necessary for all economic development. People are not going to invest in homes or businesses if they don't have access to safe, clean, reliable, and affordable water. And that 0.007% is actually a large volume of water, but it's not evenly distributed across the country or even across the state. No, and actually, it's important to understand, uh, in 2018, approximately 3.6 billion people suffered from water scarcity. Uh, by 2050, nearly 6 billion people will suffer from water scarcity. So not sure if they're going to have access to water from one day to the next. Here in McHenry County, we have the ability to have safe, reliable, and sustainable water resources, but that's only true if we protect them. So this is a map showing the distribution of water in the state of Illinois. And you can see up in the northeast corner where we are, we have access to a lot of water that the rest of the state does not have. Uh, but a lot of that's Lake Michigan, but all the brown surrounding that blue is groundwater. So here in McHenry County, and uh, we rely 100% on groundwater. Kane County is mostly groundwater. Uh, Aurora and Elgin get some of their water from the Fox River. Uh, but all through the state, they don't have access to nearly the same resources that we do up in the northeast corner. Most of the blue that you see are reservoirs where they've dammed up streams or rivers, and that's a very expensive water source. It's very expensive to create reservoirs. There are all kinds of water quality problems that can be uh, uh, associated with that, and you can lose up to 40% of that water to evaporation, where ours is actually infiltrating down, getting cleaned, and stored underground. So this is zooming in a bit. Uh, so once again, we've got a lot of blue, and this is water that's coming from Lake Michigan. And you can see most of the count, or communities around uh, Chicago are getting water from Lake Michigan, but that's a recent development. Up into the 1980s, most of these communities were also getting their water from uh, uh, groundwater. And uh, 
if anything ever happens to Lake Michigan, and that's you know a p possibility, it may not be the same resource that it is in the future, uh, but if anything ever does happen, uh, they can't go back to groundwater. And so it's very important for us to be cognizant of that. We have a, a vested interest in uh, Lake Michigan remaining viable into the future. And uh, once again, you can see we're 100% reliant on groundwater. Kane County is almost completely, except for Elgin, Elgin and Aurora, uh, and most of the communities to our west are 100% groundwater dependent. And so this is a profile view of our subsurface geology and aquifers in northeastern Illinois. This uppermost layer is, in brown is a layer of sand and gravel. So as the glaciers came down and receded, came and receded, they deposited a lot of sand and gravel in the region. Uh, particularly here in McHenry County, we had a lot of sand and gravel deposited. And when it rains or snow melts, water infiltrates down to the sand and gravel, fills the pore spaces between the sand and gravel particles and creates a water table that we can drill down below and draw water from. Below this sand and gravel layer is a layer of limestone. And the limestone's a hard, rigid rock, so it's not porous. But in areas it has cracks and fissures, and if those cracks and fissures are lined up just right, they can hold an awful lot of water. So the water will infiltrate down through the sand and gravel and then fill the limestone. So those two aquifers are interconnected. Below that, we've got three layers of sandstone. And sandstone's just like it sounds. It's sand that's been compressed and uh, turned into stone over time. Very, very tiny pore spaces, but it's such a large volume of area, it can hold an awful lot of water. The main sandstone aquifer that we utilize is this middle one. It's called the Ironton Galesville. And uh, it underlies many states. So you've got a lot of people taking water out of that. Uh, the water we get from this aquifer is recharged up in north central Wisconsin. Uh, and it'll take thousands of years for water to land up in north, or north central Wisconsin and then make its way down to us. And it's recharged there because the land above it rises up to the surface so that water can get down into this aquifer. But since it takes so long to recharge, it's, uh, it doesn't recharge in the lifetimes of people. And so it's not a renewable resource. Our sand and gravel and our limestone are renewable. Every time it rains or snow melts, those have the opportunity to recharge. As soon as we start pulling water out of the Ironton Galesville, that water table is dropping. And that's exactly what's happened. So in the Joliet area, uh, they have taken so much water out of that aquifer, it's dropped over 900 feet. And that creates what's called a Kona depression that extends underneath uh, the uh, uh, southeast corner of McHenry County. And of course, we're pulling water out of that and dropping that water table too. So conservation is going to be 100% key to our survival in the future, as is protecting our renewable aquifers. So this is an animated slide showing natural hydrology. So before we uh, start compacting and uh, uh, developing the land, this is the way th the land works. So when it would snow melt uh, or rain would fall, a good percentage of that would infiltrate down through the ground, recharge the water table. Oh, <laughs> so I'm that guy. <laughs> Uh, and uh, speaking of which, if you do have uh, phones, uh, uh, we were warned about uh, Nextels, so make sure your phones are off. Do as I say, not as I do. Sorry about that. So uh, the water infiltrates down in the ground, recharges our water table that we talked about, but water is not standing still. It goes into the ground and it's constantly moving and it's moving to the low points and it's providing a base flow of cool, clean water to our lakes, rivers, streams, and wetlands. This is natural hydrology. In a uh, urbanized environment, as we start uh, paving over things, that water is no longer able to infiltrate to, into the ground. So it hits the ground surface and rushes off, carrying with it any pollutants it comes in contact with, rushing down to our lakes, rivers, streams, and wetlands, creating a flood stage, followed by drought, flood, drought, flood, drought. So instead of a cool, clean base flow of water, its uh, conditions are extremes, and very few things can actually live there. So we're modifying our hydrology and we're modifying our recharge. And the water that does go in, the same mechanism that allows water to infiltrate down can allow contaminants to infiltrate, infiltrate down too. So it's really important for us not to put uh, pollutants in contact with our water. So 
So our water resources are th uh, vulnerable to a variety of threats. So overconsumption, if we're pulling more water out than is naturally being recharged, the water table drops. Uh, if we pave over everything and compact the soil, we're not getting that recharge. So we'll continue to take water out and drop the water table. Uh, drought, we're actually just recovering f from a major drought. McHenry County, part of Lake, uh, part of Walworth and part of Racine had this cloud of drought over us for almost three years. And the water tables dropped as much or more than they did during the drought of 2012. Uh, and we're just beginning to recover. Um, so, you know, I'm probably one of the few people that's actually excited about the rain today. Uh, but uh, uh, drought is a very serious issue. And then pollution. Anything we put in the air, onto the land, or into the ground has the potential to contaminate our water. And that includes salt. And we use an awful lot of salt. Uh, I nearly. Um, and uh, salt is toxic. It's not, like I said, it's not a benign material. It is a toxic material. And it's toxic to fish and wildlife. It kills vegetation. And it even corrodes the roads that we're trying to uh, maintain. Uh, and uh, as well as any other metal infrastructure. Uh, and uh, you've got other sources of contamination. So we do monitoring across the county. Every 10 years we run a full gamut of water quality tests in the county. And uh, we're definitely seeing increases in, in salt in our water. And this is happening around the country, around the world. This is not unique to us. It's, it's basic mechanics. Uh, but uh, we, the other sources are water softeners and fertilizers. But when we do our analysis, we can actually look at the ion structure of the different chlorides and identify what the sources are. And bar none, road salt is leaps and bounds beyond any other source of chloride in our water. So uh, chlorides are a problem. So uh, our de-icers are composed primarily of sodium chloride, but we also have calcium chloride uh, and uh, magnesium chloride. Uh, the chlorides are highly soluble to water. So as soon as it comes in contact with water, it goes into solution, becomes part of that water. And a single teaspoon of water will permanently contaminate a five gallon bucket of water. Uh, our drinking water standard is 250 milligrams per liter. Uh, that's a, a secondary standard. Uh, and that's where water starts to taste salty. Uh, in areas of uh, New Hampshire and other places where they've been using salt a lot longer, uh, they've got even bigger problems when it comes to chlorides. And uh, water, uh, hot water heaters will corrode every two years. And so the, the Department of Transportation in New Hampshire is actually having to pay to install new wells when the wells get contaminated from road salt. So there can be very dire economic consequences from this too uh, as things get worse and worse. And 250 milligrams per liter doesn't mean anything to most people, but just as a uh, comparison, a natural baseline in our area is uh, one to 10 uh, milligrams per liter. Uh, we don't have oceans, uh, you know, we don't have natural sources of chloride, so uh, we don't have high levels of chloride in our area. Uh, more realistic sizes are the containers of salt that most people have on their countertops. So a single container of salt will contaminate over four years worth of drinking water for a person or make uh, 30 gallons of water unlivable for fish forever. Uh, even more realistic size is a salt truck. So a single salt truck will contaminate over 65,000 years worth of water for a person or make 500,000 gallons of water unlivable, unlivable for fish. And we use an awful lot of salt trucks. Um, and uh, like I said, salt is a toxic material. Uh, it'll uh, cause uh, impacts to our vegetation outright. A lot of people probably have seen uh, where you've got burning of the vegetation from uh, splash from the road salt. Um, especially you guys that have uh, like the park district, you're spending a lot of money on your landscaping and a lot of effort to make your landscaping look nice. And then if we're pouring salt and damaging it, you know, we're fighting ourselves. Uh, but perhaps most importantly is as we do more and more salt or as you, uh, you stockpile your snow that is laden with salt, you can permanently destroy the, the uh, soils as well and prevent them from uh, actually growing things. Uh, I'm an ecologist, so I spent 20 years uh, working as a professional ecologist, so this is one of the things that's most important to me. Our native vegetation it didn't evolve with salt, uh, so it's not salt tolerant. Uh, and when we add more and more salt to the water, uh, it, uh, salt tolerant plants displace our native plants and take over. Um, who's familiar with Phragmites? 
a few hands. I, we should see everybody's hand, and from now on you'll know what Phragmites is. But uh, Phragmites is a monster. And uh, if you're driving uh, home today uh, and you see vegetation that's uh, 10, 15 feet tall and has a flowery head, uh, that's Phragmites. And it just completely takes over areas. Uh, and it literally is a monster. Um, and it's salt tolerant, so it gets its foothold uh, in areas uh, often like our roadside swales, but then it just travels everywhere. Everywhere. Um, I worked on uh, uh, gravel pits and, and mines where I literally saw the Phragmites climb hills 200 feet high. And so it spreads rhizomes and it just uh, will take over areas very quickly. And it's very hard to get rid of and it provides no habitat value at all. So it is a monster and it's directly tied to our use of uh, salt. And uh, large concentrations will kill fish and aquatic organisms outright, but even small amounts in our water can have uh, severe impacts on our aquatic environment. So the phytoplankton, zooplankton, and even the macroinvertebrates that are the base of the food chain uh, can get killed off from even lower levels of chloride, and that then travels up the food chain. So uh, um, in the, I don't know if I've got a slide on it, uh, but uh, we talk about chronic or acute concentrations. So in the spring when everything melts, we just get this deluge of salt going into our aquatic environment. But it does then move off in many places. Uh, lakes will continue to concentrate. Uh, but that's called a uh, uh, acute uh, uh, concentration. But then in areas like lakes or our groundwater, we'll get chronic uh, concentrations. And so the higher level of chronic uh, exposure will uh, have more and more severe impacts on our aquatic wildlife. And then uh, lakes turn over naturally. So uh, in the spring and fall, the bottom of the lake will turn over and the top of the lake will go down. And so that brings nutrients from the bottom up and then helps uh, drive the food chain. And then it brings oxygen from the top down to the lower levels. And uh, uh, chlorides are, water with chlorides are heavier, so they sink to the bottom of the lake and prevent that natural turnover. And then uh, chloride is also corrosive. So the, like I said, the very thing that we're trying to keep safe is actually getting damaged. So concrete will get uh, pitted from the uh, chlorides and then that creates opportunities uh, for the water to get in and corrode the rebar. And uh, then it'll also corrode any of our metal infrastructure. And we were talking beforehand up in Michigan, they would always joke about buying used cars from uh, people from Chicago. And this is what they would all have in mind when they talk about cars from Chicago. So uh, in the Chicago area alone, uh, there's over 28,000 linear miles of roadway. Um, and each one of those lanes, or most of those lanes at least, have multiple lanes. So that's a large area of roadway that is uh, being treated with salt. But it's not just the roadways we treat. Any paved surface in the wintertime is going to be treated with, with salt or other de-icers. So that's just an incredible amount of pavement and a, a large source of chloride all getting dumped into our groundwater and our uh, surface waters. So this is an animated slide that the Illinois State Water Survey did um, in Kane County. And uh, this, they use color coding to look at the increased concentrations of chloride over time, so from 1966 uh, to, or 1965 to 2015. And this left panel is showing the increased concentrations of chloride in the sand and gravel layer. This panel is showing the increased concentrations of, uh, in our limestone, uh, shallow bedrock layer. So we started using salt in the 1960s. And almost immediately you start seeing uh, increased concentrations of chloride. Now by the 80s, those concentrations are getting pretty concentrated. And what you're seeing is there's a direct correlation between the contamination and our roadways. So the greatest concentrations are in those areas with the higher, higher population densities and more traffic on the roadways. Uh, by the 90s, you start to see hot spots. So the oranges are 250 milligrams per liter, uh, which is our drinking water standard. Um, and uh, by the 2000s, you're seeing a lot of hot spots uh, throughout the populated areas, and you're seeing it not only in the sand and gravel layer, you're also seeing it in the uh, limestone layer. 
And so once again, there's a direct correlation between the contamination and our use of uh, road salt on our uh, parking lots and sidewalks and roadways. Unfortunately, there is no alternative to salt at the moment. You know, the uh, person who comes up with that magic elixir uh, as an alternative to salt is going to make a lot of money. Uh, uh, but uh, at the moment, we do not have a viable alternative to salt. So our best option is to use salt wisely. And uh, I've chaired a, uh, a organization, uh, the Northwest Water Planning Alliance is an organization dedicated to water quality. Uh, and drinking water, and we have a sensible salting subcommittee that I've chaired. And uh, this is the uh, definition that we uh, came up with, and it's the use of best management practices for snow and ice management that maintains safety for pedestrians, drivers, vehicles, and property while eliminating the unnecessary use of salt to minimize impacts to water in the environment. And two things that I want to emphasize is that we're not talking about reduced safety. We're absolutely 100% talking about maintaining safety, but eliminating the unnecessary use of salt. So much that we put down provides absolutely no benefit, uh, but it comes at great environmental and economic cost. Um, so at a residential scale, um, the main focus is physical removal of the snow. We do not want to be using chemicals to burn off the snow. You want to shovel that snow or plow the snow or snow blow the snow before you have compaction, before you drive on it, walk on it is the optimal time, you wanna, but you want to physically remove it. You do not want to use road salts or other de-icers to burn off the snow. Um, there is no such thing as an environmentally friendly de-icer. When you go to the store, you're going to see that term used over and over again, environmentally friendly. The only environmentally friendly de-icer out there is the de-icer that doesn't get put down. Um, all de-icers have impacts. Uh, uh, one of the uh, materials, I don't know if I've got this on my next slide. Yeah, so one of the materials uh, that you'll see out there is calcium magnesium acetate, and that's not a chloride-based product. Uh, but that has nutrients in it. And so when the nutrients, uh, when the snow melts, it, those nutrients go into our waterways and, the can, can, can contribute to water pollution. So nothing is benign. Uh, but the main ones that we use is sodium chloride, calcium chloride, and magnesium, uh, magnesium chloride. Uh, and the bags that we buy at the store will typically have a blending of them. But sodium chloride is only effective down to 15 degrees. Uh, so if you're putting uh, t uh, sodium chloride down at zero degrees, it's not going to do anything. So you need, may, need to make sure that you're putting the right product down for the right temperature. Um, and so sodium chloride is down, goes down to 15 degrees. Calcium chloride goes down to negative 25. Magnesium chloride goes down to zero. And then the CMA only goes down to 20 and you will see that in in the stores uh, but the price difference is massive uh, so it's typically blends that you'll see so you want to look on the bags and make sure you're getting a uh, product that will work in the conditions that you're going to be using it and only apply what's needed so I've already talked about the cups that the salt smart collaborative put together um, this takes care of a traditional driveway uh, or 10 squares of sidewalk. You, you don't need to be putting piles down and each kernel of salt will typically melt a 12 inch radius. Uh, so you can have a broadly uh, uh, dispersed pattern uh, as opposed to clumps. Uh, yeah, so once again only put down what's needed and uh, you know, you should probably use, I, what I use is a hand spreader on my, at my house, and I'm only putting it down where it's needed. So I've got a, a, an incline on my driveway, so I put salt there, um, and then I've got a walkway with a 90 degree turn. So people walking on that have to make a pivot, and so that's another place that I'll put salt. So I target where I put it, and then I use a salt spreader that has an adjustable dial, and uh, so I can kind of key in the dispersal pattern, and it also allows me to kind of put it where it's needed. Uh, if you're just grabbing this, that's, that's okay, but you're not going to have a, a even distribution uh, that you would if you're using some type of equipment. So keep that in mind, particularly you guys are doing sidewalks and parking lots and things like that. Uh, but, uh, you know, you want a broad dispersal pattern, so putting it where it's needed. So roads and parking lots is a, another size up. Uh, the same things apply, uh, but it has uh, some different tools in the toolbox. 
But the main goal is a physical removal of snow and ice, uh, not burning it off with chemicals. We want to use chemicals wisely to strategically prevent ice from forming, uh, and that's where we use liquids uh, before a storm, uh, or we use it to break up and melt ice that has formed. But we're not using it just out uh, to uh, put the salt down and melt everything off. We are wanting to physically remove that snow and ice. Uh, like I said, we have a lot of tools in our toolbox. It's not a one-size-fits-all. The main thing right off the bat is proper storage. Uh, there's no excuse at all for uh, piles like this anymore. This was in a, uh, behind a strip mall in Crystal Lake, um, and you can see it was right on top of a storm sewer. So every time it rained or snow melted, all that salt was just gushing into the storm sewer. This storm sewer is corroded. I mean, it, it, its lifespan was uh, shrunk in half. So this all this infrastructure is going to have a, a very short lifespan so, uh, uh, because of the, the salt. And the contractor that put the salt here is probably not the one that's going to be paying to replace all this. That's going to fall on the shoulders of the taxpayer. Um, this was actually the next strip mall over and they did a much better job. Uh, so they have uh, concrete blocks uh, on three sides of it. It's placed on a high point so water is not flowing into the pile. Um, they keep it uh, covered with a tarp across the entire thing. Uh, they had it weighted down with uh, tires uh, and so it's a much better job, but uh, the only complaint that I would have is they had uh, a lot of salt that should have been swept up. Uh, so good housekeeping practices uh, should be employed. But anybody that's using salt regularly should have some type of permanent cover now. There are so many different options available today, there's no excuse to have open piles like that. And plus you're losing your, your salt when you have it like that. Every time it rains, your salt pile is shrinking. Uh, it's providing no benefit to humanity, but it's coming at great environmental and economic cost. Uh, calibrate. Uh, if we're not measuring, uh, if we don't have any control over what we're putting down, we have no way of putting down the right amount. So you need to calibrate your equipment. Uh, equipment does not come calibrated and it doesn't stay calibrated, so we recommend that you calibrate your equipment at least once a year. If you calibrate your equipment, you have some control over what you're putting down. And once again, you want to put down the proper uh, application. So you want a dis uh, uh, distribution like that not like this. If you're going crunch, crunch, crunch from your car to the door, uh, you're doing something wrong. Uh, unfortunately, in the private sector, more and more, the, your property owners are afraid of lawsuits, so they ask for more and more of this. So we have to have a better understanding of why we don't want to do that, and uh, that's something that John will talk about. And uh, so this is a, like a traditional spinner. Uh, Matt Widom, who was uh, uh, with uh, Spring Grove, he's uh, now up in the town of Lynn, had modified the spinner so that it put the material down in the middle of the roadway so that it spread across the road as opposed to on one side of the road. And so once again, it's important to put it where it's actually going to be used. And uh, pre-wetting salt. Salt actually needs to be wet to work. Uh, if you're putting it down in the dry, that is not going to work until it actually gets wet. And uh, so pre-wetting salt uh, allows the salt to be put down in an active state, uh, and it also reduces bounce. Now this may be a bit more important for roads where you're traveling at higher speeds, but the same principles apply. Uh, if you've got salt that's bouncing off into the right away, right away or if it's getting pushed up against a curb where it's not providing any benefit, uh, it's, you know, it's waste. Uh, it's providing no benefit, but it's coming at great environmental and economic cost. And uh, once again, using the correct product for the pavement temperature. There can be a big difference between the air temperature and the pavement temperature. Uh, so I think John will probably talk about that. But you want to measure the pavement temperature and then use the right product uh, for the uh, pavement temperature. Uh, Anti-icing. So this is where we put uh, liquids down before a storm event. And the, we're putting a mixture of liquid brine down uh, before a storm, and that prevents ice from forming and allows us to more easily and more completely physically remove the snow uh, when we do our plowing. And then the residual material then helps to uh, uh, maintain bare pavement much quicker without repeated applications of salt. Um, and most people have seen these lines now, uh, uh, but uh, um, you know, as you drive around this winter and you start seeing these stripes, you know a storm's coming. Uh, there is a direct correlation there. 
And then uh, I don't know that this applies to parking lots so much, but uh, more and more uh, is being done to have uh, liquid de-icing as well as uh, liquid anti-icing. So our McHenry County Division of Transportation has four routes that are liquid only. Uh, each one of those routes uh, results in about a 38% reduction in the amount of salt that's being put down. And then that also translates into dollar savings. And so they started with one route kind of experimentally and then they start a uh, second route and a third route. And so now they've got four dedicated routes that are liquid only. Uh, there are certain times where you have weather conditions where you can't put the liquids down. Uh, and uh, so uh, like freezing rain, uh, if you put the liquids down, that'll just uh, get washed off. Uh, but uh, other than that, they are strictly using liquids on those four routes. And uh, this probably doesn't apply to many, uh, maybe some of the park district, uh, but uh, living snow fences. Uh, so um, we uh, work with farmers uh, to leave about 18 rows of corn up at the end of the season. Uh, and then that uh, captures the snow uh, and prevents the drifting from occurring. Uh, with drifting, you're going out repeatedly over and over again to push the snow banks back uh, and have to reapply over and over and over again. Uh, it makes the roads much more dangerous. Uh, so by reducing drifting, we're making our, uh, our operators safer for our operators. Uh, we're reducing mobilizations, uh, we're reducing cost, and we're reducing pollution. Um, so this is a great thing. Uh, you know, we also would like to see permanent living snow fences. We're using a combination of shrubs. Uh, if you drive to Madison, uh, once you get over the border, keep an eye on either side of the road and you'll see black matting with shrubs sticking out of it. So they are doing permanent snow fencing all along I-90 as you go uh, north into Wisconsin. And uh, I would like to work with like Pheasants Forever and other groups to do permanent living snow fences here in the county. Uh, it provides habitat for the uh, uh, pheasants and other wildlife throughout the winter and then provides all the other benefits that we just talked about. And then training. So you guys are practicing sensible salting right here. You didn't even know it. Uh, we just finished two days of training. Uh, we have annual workshops in McHenry County that we've been doing since 2009. Lake County has been doing a great job uh, with uh, the, both having training for both parking lots and sidewalks and uh, roads as well as the Conservation Foundation. So everybody's trying to do a, a, a good job with training and education. Um, we now need to see people actually implementing it. Uh, so uh, that's w what we're talking about today. Um, like I said, I chaired uh, the Northwest Water Planning Alliance and Sensible Salting Committee, and most municipalities are doing some form of sensible salting. They've got a long way to go, don't get me wrong, but where we could have the greatest reduction in chloride pollution is on our parking lots and sidewalks. So that is really, really where we focused. And we had come up with a four-step plan to help change the way uh, salting is done on parking lots and sidewalks. First was to develop a regional sensible salting manual. Lake County, McHenry County, we're all doing similar things, but we weren't all on the same book. Uh, so the first thing was to create a, a regional manual that we could all be working off of, and then establish a professional regional training and certification program based on that manual. Um, then we would work with municipalities, school districts, and others to require certified contractors be hired. That would then drive, uh, use market forces to drive that change and increase demand for uh, tr uh, sensible salting. Um, and then once we have that in place, we could use that as a foundation for state uh, legislation that would provide liability coverage, limited liability coverage for property owners that hire certified contractors. Um, so that was kind of the goal. Um, and fortunately, we have some very smart people, uh, one of whom is in the room today. So Jennifer Hammer uh, had been working on uh, this program, or a similar uh, initiative with the uh, uh, Salt Smart Collaborative and were, was able to get a 319 grant to implement the manual, create the manual and the training and certification program. So taking it from concept to real life. And so they've been working really hard on this and um, uh, the training, the manual is almost done and the training and certification programs uh, almost there too. And in 2023, this will become a reality. And so Jennifer will be here to talk about that. Uh, so what can you do? Uh, we can use sensible salting practices at our homes or business. 
Uh, hire snow removal contractors knowledgeable or certified with anti-icing or sensible salting practices at your home or business. And so with school districts, you guys can uh, require uh, certified contractors once that training and certification program is up or work with uh, your, your uh, uh, contractors uh, to implement sensible salting practices. Um, and then uh, you know, work with elected officials or local public works departments to expand their anti-icing and sensible salting practices. So you know, we may need to put a little pressure on our, our public works departments and others to really start implementing these things and not just going to training uh, programs every year. Uh, it really makes economic sense as well as it improves safety and uh, it makes sure that we'll have water into the future. So like I said, this is real uh, common sense mechanics. Uh, this is not real highfalutin stuff. I mean, this is real practical information. Um, so that's all I've got. Uh, are there any questions so far? Yes, sir. Scott, I didn't, I didn't, it's not really a question, but I, I, I heard you say the word economic, but, but I don't, I, in my experience that we've been doing it now for a few years, it's, it's really uh, an important piece is we, we do uh, save money yep. by, by doing anti-icing in, in lieu of uh, reactive management after an event. And it's, it's notable amount. Yeah, it's you know that's uh, over and over again. I mean, that's what comes back. If you're doing it right, uh, you know this really does save money. Uh, I don't have the, all the numbers. This is something that our, our guys uh, that do this type of work every day have a better handle on. But uh, the amount of salt that they use at at, the, at McHenry County Division of Transportation now is a fraction of what they had used before, uh, and they've eased into it. You know, you don't just jump in and, and do everything perfectly. It's not what's expected. You know, start you know with what you can do. It what you have access to, what your interest is. Uh, Matt Whittem at, uh, in uh, Spring Grove uh, ended up fabricating a lot of his own equipment. Uh, you know, so it wasn't like he got a, a ton of money in to do this. You know, he, he saw the, the need and saw the benefit and eased into it. Uh, so you know, don't feel that you have to do everything perfectly, but um, this stuff really does make a lot of sense. Anybody else? Yes, sir. You mentioned about wetting the salt. Yep. It with, with more chemicals? So brine. So using liquid brine. So typically, the way it works uh, is you'll uh, at the spinner you'll be spraying onto uh, the uh, material as it is on the spinner, and then spreads out in a wet uh, and it sticks to the ground. Um, you can buy salt pre-treated, and that's actually what our division of transportation does. They buy the salt pre-wet, uh, and it, they use uh, chemicals to pre-wet the material. Um, but uh, as you're driving this winter uh, look at the spinner and uh, you'll see the the liquids uh, being applied as it's uh, dropping to the ground. Okay. Are you using liquids at all? Yeah. I, I'm pointing to the guy in front of you. <laughs> yeah. And in some places they also will pre-wet their piles before they go ahead and load from the from the pile onto the truck. Okay. But yeah we, we pre we pre-apply in our auger. Okay. How cold is that good for? What's that? How low can you go with them with the uh, wedding? Uh, I think you can, uh, you know, I, you're, I don't know, that's a good question. Do you ha can you answer that? We've found that if, if you're already making the brine, it's activating everything so much quicker. So you can probably get another 10 degrees at least colder out of your solution because really it's, it's the same. It's the same product, you're just making it already a liquid right. uh, in tanks. At least that's how we do. Ours is just a brine solution, so we're not using beet juice or anything else. Okay. So we're just taking the, the salt and making it into a liquid form and then using that for our pre-wet applications. Okay, well, and that's a, you brought up one more good thing. Uh, so when you hear about beet juice uh, being used, the beet juice is not replacing the salt. Uh, the beet juice is added to the liquid brine uh, as a, it referred to as a carbohydrate. So it's a sugar, it's sticky. So it helps the, the brine adhere to the pavement, but it also lowers the, the, the temperature that it'll work at. So it actually reduces, you know, so you can put it out in colder and colder temperatures. Um, and so the, the beet juice improves the efficiency of it, but it doesn't replace the the, uh, the 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 chloride materials. Nancy, uh, the environmental defenders have several projects that we carry out with uh, Algonquin Township, so I'm familiar with their road district garage. And if any of you would like to go down, I don't know if you have anything to do with Algonquin Township, but I know that they would be happy to show you what they have created because in one of their uh, bays of their 
huge garage. Oh, you're shaking your head, huh? Uh, they, they have set up their own system for mixing all of this, and it doesn't take up a lot of space. Uh, it'd be worth just going down there someday if you just want to give uh, Daniela with Algonquin Township Road District a uh, call. She'd be happy to show you. Yeah, and the, uh, I don't know if they're going to open it up or not, but uh, uh, one of the things that we're talking about with the DOT, uh, the Village of Algonquin, and others is uh, with calibration, uh, that's, you know, one of the, the basics. I mean, everybody should be calibrating, but if you don't know how to calibrate, that can be kind of tricky. So what they're talking about doing is opening up uh, a day or two uh, for people to come in with their trucks, and they can uh, be taught how to properly calibrate uh, uh, their equipment, uh, so reducing the you know the uh, you know that low, flattening that learning curve and helping you out. So if that's something that you'd be interested in, you know keep an ear out, and I'll make sure that that information gets out to you. Uh, and before I turn it over, I do want to also emphasize, you know we're handing uh, raffling off a uh, liquid push spreader, um, and uh, so this allows you to use uh, liquids uh, at, on your sidewalks or even parking lot. Um, so please drop a business card in the uh, back over here. Uh, it's a $500 piece of equipment that we're giving away for free. Um, and then uh, we are also getting ready to start a uh, liquid push spreader loan program. So I was able to get two pieces of uh, really high-end commercial grade uh, push spreaders donated from the manufacturer and I'm going to work with the Division of Transportation to make this available to school districts, uh, municipalities, libraries, any type of government entity will uh, work with and you can rent the, uh, the spreader for a week or two. Uh, we'll provide you uh, liquid, uh, like 80 gallons of liquid to uh, work with. Um, I'm buying, uh, well, I've got a, a, a lead-in uh, for my own stuff, but uh, I'm also going to be purchasing uh, uh, from FS uh, material for another uh, project. And so that may be a good source of liquids at a small scale. Um, but if you're really going to get into it, hey, hey Doug? Uh, as far as liquids go, are you purchasing a tanker? How are you doing it? We, we, uh, we purchased a 10,000 gallon tank uh, and the reason we picked that size is because um, our property takes about 3,300 gallons with the one uh, at the icing app. And uh, we also found out for our economy of uh, delivery, delivery is an important piece of the cost for us because we don't make it ourselves. Uh, we're told a 4,000 gallon tanker uh, we can get a pretty good price point. So, you know, we tell our crew when it when it gets down to like, you know, close to 4,000 gallons, tell us and we get call another truck out to refill it. And it keeps us rolling pretty reasonably. Um, and uh, I think we're paying about 80, last I heard is 83 cents a gallon or something like that. I know if you make it yourself, you can get it down probably a bit more, but we just don't have the manpower to yeah, and John can talk about making your own and uh, his experience with that. Uh, but you can, can do this at all different scales, I guess is the point. So like I said, FS has containers going from like 100 pounds or 100 gallons to 1,000 gallons. That's so, where we get ours. Oh, is it FS? 4,000. Okay. So you've got opportunities out there. So, in any case, that's enough with me. Uh, I'd like to introduce Jennifer Hammer. Uh, Jennifer is with the Conservation Foundation, and she is in charge of the uh, Salt Smart Collaborative, and uh, we're very fortunate to have her here today. A couple of slides about the Conservation Foundation. Uh, we're celebrating our 50th year uh, working on land and water conservation uh, in kind of the northeastern Illinois area. We do a lot with land preservation, with uh, water, rivers, watershed protection, uh, environmental education, stewardship. Um, we worked a lot with the folks up in McHenry County uh, through the years, um, which is why McHenry County is not colored in up here because there's a lot of great work by similar organizations up here. Uh, but most of our work is done in DuPage, King, Kendall, and Will counties uh, with some focus in Cook County, Grundy County, LaSalle, uh, and DeKalb. And uh, our offices down, are down in Naperville skip through some of these. So the Salt, Salt Smart Collaborative, uh, which Scott mentioned, is really we, so many of us are working on chloride issues and water quality issues uh, through the various water quality, uh, watershed groups uh, across the region, the counties, communities, everybody's working at this uh, from a different angle. Uh, 
but we've all kind of been out there as our own individual voices. And so the point behind the Salt Smart Collaborative was to bring us all together, help elevate um, kind of the messaging around this, and work on outreach and training. And so we have a whole bunch of different organizations pulled together under the collaborative. And uh, I know Scott mentioned it, uh, although we all have different reasons for why we might use less salt, uh, it is still the focus of everything we do is still safety. Uh, we are not compromising safety for the environment. We're not asking you to do less uh, as far as what your safety goals are. Uh, but the reality is, is we, lace, we waste a whole lot of salt, and, and Scott touched on that. And all that salt that ends up, uh, whether it's up against the curb, in the right of way, the salt that's went on a sidewalk and it's all the way up against the building, uh, all of that salt is wasted salt. It's not clearing and keeping the surfaces safe that you know, we're either driving on or walking on. Uh, so lots of wasted salt and that's really, the very least, this is where we're starting in reducing that salt. Again, lots of tools in the toolbox like Scott mentioned. Uh, lots of ways for us to reduce that wasted salt, be proactive, um, and really truly save time and money as we're doing it. And the practices um, that Scott mentioned, when I mean, you look at anti-icing and pre-wetting, these are not like new practices. Uh, there's a really good bulletin from Wisconsin DOT, I think it's from like the 90s. I mean, they've been working, <laughs> they've been doing these practices for a really long time. Um, so we're, we're really talking about industry accepted practices. So the Salt Smart Certified Program that, that Scott mentioned, it really is looking at a whole number of different uh, Salt Smart practices, best management practices, however you want to refer to them, but taking all of these individual practices and really putting them all together so that we can get kind of the biggest bang for our buck uh, as we go forward. And this certification program, we are coming to uh, at least to a point where we, we, have, we have a really good manual in place. We're, we're working with graphic design right now. Uh, we've had some uh, great folks on our steering committee, uh, John being one of them, Scott as well, of really our focus for this training is for that parking lots and sidewalks audience and, and then within that audience really targeting contractors. And so looking and trying to address uh, the issues that contractors are facing. So looking for an Illinois-based certification program, there are a few other certification programs out there. Um, Minnesota has one, Wisconsin to a lesser degree, more within the Madison area. Um, New Hampshire has one. Mm, I think those are kind of the main ones that are out there right now. So really having something that's focused for Illinois, um, they'll have, still looking at all of the details on it, but there'll be kind of a, uh, certification level for individuals as well as then for businesses uh, or organizations. And like Scott mentioned, we would definitely, once we get these things in place, really want to work with municipalities and counties uh, to start at the very least recommending the use of contractors with these certifications um, and where it's appropriate to really get that into ordinances for requirements down the road uh, when we can get enough folks uh, trained through the program. Um, again, our initial focus with the Salt Smart Certified Program is for contractors uh, and well, parking lots and sidewalks, so really geared towards contractors and uh, kind of sm smaller site operations like park districts and school districts. Uh, so the manual be kind of the biggest central piece to it, um, and we've kind of started with manuals that have been developed by others. So a lot of the trainings that have been done uh, through Lake County, and some of the trainings that McHenry County has done in the past that are geared towards parking lots and sidewalks has brought in a firm out of Minnesota using the Minnesota manual, um, which was a great starting place. But it was also a very broad manual, kind of really trying to do everything for everybody. And so we started with that. Um, that's what Scott um, and the Sensible Salting Committee uh, and Lake County had kind of started from that manual, adapted some things for Illinois, and then that was the point where, uh, with the grant that we got from the Illinois Environmental Protection Agency, kind of started from there and then tried to, to look at how to further 
uh, refine it for Illinois. And in the end, we came up with, I think, a really standalone document. I mean, it's very different from, I think, what Minnesota has done, uh, as well as newer manuals from Wisconsin, uh, really focusing on uh, the target audience that we really want at the table. And looking at ways to help support their transition from where they've been uh, to where we want them to go. Uh, again, highlighting those their industry accepted practices. And an interesting thing with uh, the way technology has moved is that both from the folks on the public works side of it as well as from the contractor side of it, uh, like Scott had mentioned, uh, Matt Whittem, you know, building some of his own equipment or different uh, shops adjusting equipment or building their spray bars. Well, all the folks who build this stuff have realized that, which is why you see so many more uh, products, equipment that's out there to do this. And, and it, it came from those end users uh, really kind of pushing the envelope on what they wanted to see and what they wanted to be able to do. Uh, so all of those things, they did, it didn't come from the environmental end uh, necessarily. I mean, it, that's out there and people saw that, but uh, these practices, they, they, the, the equipment, the newer equipment, it works better and it uses less salt and in the end saves money. Um, some of the things, I'll kind of cover a little bit more of this, but one of the things that we want to do through the program too is to support uh, those contractors who are using these practices. So looking at marketing material, uh, ways to you know provide them with material to help educate their clients. Because with anything, wherever you're changing anything, being able to talk to your client and explain why this is a better approach, um, having somebody else besides it just coming from you is helpful. Um, so we're working on putting some of those things together and then looking at sort of what the having some required like annual reporting on, on the amount of salt you're using, the practices you're using, kind of build into that certification program. Um, you know, really looking at something that is self-reporting. We don't want to make it so onerous uh, that people don't want to participate in it, but at the same time having some accountability. And uh, the plan is to have our training program in place. Uh, so we're offering trainings in 2023 uh, and looking at both uh, some in-person formats as well as like a live virtual format. Some of the other things that we want to continue to work on, and uh, some of this is sort of working hand in hand with the current training that we're putting together, but looking at those other audiences that need to hear this. Um, and property management uh, companies and owners, those folks who are hiring the contractors out there, they need to be hearing these things as well. And so the more that we can bring that part of the audience along on why these practices are better, um, the more that's gonna help our process in the end. Uh, so again, drive, having that market force driving uh, these changes and, and really seeing the value of having the certification. Uh, we're looking, so we're looking actually at trying to develop a short training because uh, all those folks who do property management, they all have little letters after their name. They all have their professional certifications and they need an additional, you know, continuing education credits. And so being able to craft a, a class to, for them to sit in and continue their education credits, uh, but also hear this message and see how this applies to, to them as property managers, uh, you know, whether they're managing kind of commercial spaces, industrial spaces, homeowner associations, uh, they are a, a key audience to bring along. For the bigger, broader picture of looking at uh, elected officials and sort of upper level management within communities, you know, why these things are good, because unfortunately, uh, no, unfortunately, fortunately, maybe, uh, you know, elections are coming, they're there every year, and we're continually getting in new people into these positions. And to have them understand the importance of this and why their uh, staff are doing these practices and that they have a plan and that they're following a plan and that there's reasons why they're doing the things they're doing and when, you know, they're one of their constituents who lives on a cul-de-sac calls them up and like, why did it take, you know, a day and a half for the plow to finally get to, to my cul-de-sac. 
well, you know, we just had six inches of snow. <laughs> we needed to clear in front of the school, in front of the fire department, in front, you know, the hospital. It, there's an order to things, and we can't be everywhere every uh, all the time. And have, you know, our elected officials and leadership understanding why these decisions are made. And again, that we have a plan. We're not throwing just throwing salt in the truck and sending people out on their merry way. Uh, and then homeowner associations is another key topic area um, that we're always working on, on on a lot of different messaging in this salt smart uh, portion of things is, is being already worked into a lot of those discussions. And then some of the other things, you know, we, we kind of a whole list of additional trainings that we want to put together, things that are shorter and you know geared towards a pretty tight audience because not necessarily everybody in the organization needs to actually know how to make brine. We just need the folks there who or that that's part of their job. Um, and how, you know, getting into anti-icing if you're not doing it already or into the direct liquids application. Some of those newer uh, practices that, that do take time. Uh, none of this stuff happens overnight. And being able to hook up people uh, with others, just like uh, was mentioned of, you know, going down and, and taking a tour of, of the Algonquin Township uh, garage. And to be able to connect you with people who are already doing this is the, the best way to learn these things. And that's also a big part of the collaborative and the trainings that we do is to help make those connections so that you have people that you can reach out to and ask questions to uh, and help maybe learn from mistakes that they made in the past or you know, you're looking at a couple different pieces of equipment and get feedback on you know, what they think about that equipment or what they think about uh, you know, a particular product. And then also as part of the program uh, to provide materials for doing internal uh, training. And that's you know, part of the program uh, that we want is you know, the, the program itself, our training program right now is really geared towards owners, supervisors, manager sort of level, people who are making decisions within uh, whether you know, the, uh, the business or uh, some of these other organizations. That's where this training, you know, the training material is really geared towards that. We don't necessarily expect you to send, you know, all of your, both whether they're permanent employees or uh, seasonal employees, to send them to another outside training. To be able to just provide materials, kind of hitting the reasons of the why we're doing some of these things and why we're asking them to, uh, where, you, where your role is. Like everybody has a role in good housekeeping. Everybody has a role in uh, reporting and documenting things uh, as well as understanding like why it's really important to follow the guidelines of whatever plan your organization has. <coughs> mm. And um, kind of pulled this out of one of the other presentations I've done. And so from whether this is a salt smart community or a salt smart organization, however you want to look at it, you know, there's, there's all of these different, uh, you know, practices that are pulled in. So there's the physical practices of like how we're clearing the roads and how we're putting salt down, um, but also how we're communicating with our public, whomever they may be literally uh, public for a municipality or your client base or you know the other homeowners in your subdivision there's a lot of different things we can and should be communicating to people and and that's a piece of the whole process um, you know we're, we're coming at it from as many different directions as we can uh, because not everybody's going to hear the message in the same way and there's a likely a whole bunch of people who will never hear the message that we're trying to tell them uh, which you know that's pretty much across the board for anything, uh, but communication is a big piece of it. And then for, for any organization, that you do have some sort of plan, and whether it's a policy that you have as a business, whether it's your snow and ice plan as a municipality, these plans should be in place identifying your current practices. And, um, and everybody should know about that plan. So whether it's all of your employees should be aware of what's in that plan and why, uh, but as a municipality that, you know, particularly all the staff who are involved in any sense of the, or any part of the winter operations, so whether that's from the plow driver to the person who's answering phones uh, and, you know, hearing people's complaints, that everybody knows what the plan is, uh, but also that your elected officials, again, know that you have a plan, you're implementing a plan, or your leadership, whomever it is, that that plan is out there. Um, uh, that's the plan, yep. 
So one of the other pieces um, that through the work that I'm doing through the watershed groups, uh, but it also ties into the SaltSmart certified training is that salt storage component that Scott mentioned. And this really is kind of low hanging fruit for a municipality and especially a municipality that is an MS4. So that's part of that uh, municipal storm sewer, separated storm sewer uh, permit that you get from the state of Illinois. Anything that's going into that storm drain in a parking lot is going into your storm sewer system um, and that really does give you the right to be able to regulate what goes down into that storm sewer because that's coming into your system and then it becomes your problem. Um, and so looking at salt storage ordinances is a really good way to start getting on top of those salt piles that are left in parking lots. Um, there are, so for the tiny little parking lots, they're not storing salt because like they're gonna just have, if you hire a contractor, they're gonna have the salt they need in their truck, they're gonna come out and do your parking lot. It's those larger sites uh, where they're gonna be wanting to store salt on site. But again, like Scott said, when that salt is sitting there and it's uncovered, every time it rains, snow melts, your salt, your product, what you paid money for is going down the drain. Um, and so having covered salt storage, not only good for our water resources, but it's also good for your bottom line, that you're not losing your product. So from the standpoint of having, you know, now there's always pushback on new ordinances, new regulations, but there is value here for everybody in that by having that sort properly uh, sited in your parking lot and then covered, that that is gonna save money and it's gonna save environment. So those are some things that you know we can really start thinking about um, and there's good reasons to do it. And then as we get the program in place to be encouraging, to be requiring uh, the certification, I mean, that's a down the road a little ways, uh, but that's something that we're definitely gonna work towards. And then also from that municipal standpoint of We've done, uh, through some of the watershed groups, particularly the DuPage River Salt Creek Work Group, they've been working with a number of communities to actually test uh, what is being collected in their street sweeping uh, debris and looking at how much they're actually able to pull, how much salt is in that street sweeping debris. And the, the fact that at the end of the season, many communities are doing street sweeping and uh, partly just because it makes your community look nicer in the spring once all the snow melts and all the crud that was hiding in the snow is now on, on the side of the road. Uh, so there's you know just some of the aesthetic component of that street sweeping, and getting that material off the road, but there's a big value in getting salt off the road. So we don't wanna leave all our salt there and then come by and sweep, but knowing that your street sweeping is actually adding to that collection of uh, that excess salt that's out there. It's also been interesting to see, because we've been looking at a couple of communities, looking at their street sweepings throughout the entire summer and into fall, and how much salt still remains in those street sweeping materials or debris uh, throughout the entire summer. Uh, and it's, you know, whether it's getting washed off of other surfaces, I don't, it's amazing how long it is sticking out there uh, in our system. And, you know, as that, the, another, part of that corrosion uh, aspect and, and all of that salt getting into our storm sewers and definitely reducing the life of our pipe systems. Uh, I'm pretty sure it was a city of Naperville. So they do a lot of, they have a vac truck of their own and they would be cleaning out storm sewers to keep, just keeping them clear. But the amount of salt that they were pulling out of those storm sewers as they were doing their maintenance actually rusted their truck from the inside out. Uh, so you're talking about a you know over two hundred thousand dollar plus piece of equipment, uh, you know that salt is is impacting, and that's why you see so many of the new trucks out there that uh, like the dump trucks and the salt trucks are stainless steel bodies. Uh, obviously, a lot more expensive, but it's part of that corrosion issue. And then I think the last part of what I was going to cover was the outreach materials that we've been working on uh, through uh, many of our partners, through many of the watershed groups. Uh, putting together uh, a whole number of materials out there available for anybody to use. Uh, SaltSmart.org is the website. There's a little tab on the top, a little pull-down menu, outreach materials. Um, 
oh, I threw this in there, some, some of the other training materials. So Scott had mentioned like the workshops they've done here in McHenry County. We do a series of workshops every winter um, that are hosted by partners. Clear Roads is another great resource, particularly for municipal and road agencies. Um, and then uh, this uh, Ash Toe, which is a highway group. I forget what the whole acronym stands for. They have a whole podcast system, assist, uh, podcast that's just focused on winter operations. Uh, so some great resources out there uh, to continually, you know, learn more stuff, be able to document, and you know, share that with people who might be skeptical uh, as you're moving through. We have links to our own webinars that we have worked on, uh, as well as links to some training materials that uh, have been developed up in Minnesota uh, geared towards small site operations. We've linked to a number of the uh, webinars that SaltWise out of Wisconsin has done. So again, the whole idea of the collaborative is, is to take what other people are doing and elevate that and get that out across a wider audience. Uh, for anybody who does a newsletter or shares information with their publics, we have a whole bunch of different blog posts. Uh, you can either take our post and share it, or you can, uh, we have the Word documents, you can just download it, make adjustments to it. Uh, we have a, a bunch of different social media uh, graphics that can be used, and whether you link them with uh, the blog post or use them as standalone. Um, we have a number of posters. I brought a few copies of some of them with me today. Uh, so kind of focusing on like a poster you could put if you're going to put a shovel and some salt in the you know front walkway to have a poster that goes along with it. Um, been really trying to hit hard liquids and helping people talk about liquids. Um, let's see. Oh, and just like what we need residents to do. So thinking about what you're doing at home, but also as a commuter, uh, the role that you play and how you can help out. And then we, our newest poster uh, this one this year is focused on, you know, keeping those things, keeping things out of the road uh, that make it harder to get roads plowed. So you know whether that's your vehicles uh, out on the road when they shouldn't be. Uh, but one thing that like may not think about like it's garbage day and it's snowing, like make sure your tote is actually still on your driveway so the plow when the plow comes by they're not kind of weaving around garbage trucks. And it's those little things that help the the process go faster and uh, get the road in front of your house cleared faster. We have a comic, we have the little bookmarks that are in the back, we have the cups. Uh, we have a webinar that's really geared towards a uh, more residential type webinar. Uh, and let's see, let's see if this will play. This was a video. So the city of Edina put that uh, video together. They were happy to share it with us down here. Um, so we have that available uh, also for download on our YouTube channel, so a PSA that can be shared. Uh, we have a couple of different FAQ options on the website. Like we have one that is standalone. You can use it on your, on your own. And we also have it as a Word document that you can incorporate like your own information from your community, particularly if you have ordinances around you know, how sidewalks are cleared or clearing in front of uh, fire hydrants or 
I think every community out there has something about not pushing snow in your, from your driveway out into the roadway. So those are things that can be incorporated into that. Um, and then we also have uh, some other little social media pieces that can help put that personal face onto our plow drivers. You know, these folks are out there driving in uh, very difficult conditions for many hours uh, in very loud and vibrating trucks. And when they're done, uh, they still got to go home and plow their own driveways. And so, again, putting that human face onto, onto our issue. And that's all I have. If there's any questions. Yes? Um, for the social media stuff that um, you all do, what's the, how do we follow you? What's the handle? What do you do? So we have a, um, I think there are links on the website. We have a Facebook page for SaltSmart. Or, so SaltSmart has its own Facebook page that we post to. And then all of the social media pieces are also in that outreach page that you can download them and use them yourself as well. And we're always looking for ideas or if you have cool videos or things that you've put together uh, for your community or your organization, uh, we would love to be able to post them and, you know, again, we want to highlight the work that, that everybody's doing in this space. Or if you have ideas about other topics that we could be focusing on. I'll have you put you on the spot here. Okay. I'm just going to get close to you so the mic will pick okay. me up. Uh, so, uh, you know, we have a couple people from the real estate industry and, you know, this is a, um, an opportunity, I guess, uh, for the commercial industry. You know, this is definitely going to be, you know, something that impacts uh, property owners and, uh, you know, the public's awareness about this topic is going to grow. And so by having SALT smart certification and uh, other aspects of this, I think it really can provide bragging rights for a lot of uh, organizations. Uh, and then, you know, it does save money. Uh, and uh, part of what this is, is uh, instead of having uh, contracts where the contractor is paid for the amount of SALT that's put down, uh, have performance-based contracts. Uh, so part of what we're going to be looking at, and I think this is going to be part of our, our, our training cert certification program and the, and the manual, is kind of empowering uh, entities to uh, implement these things better. So having performance-based contracts, you're, you know, what you really want is safety. You know, you really don't want salt down and you don't want to be paying for more salt than you need to pay for. If you have a contract uh, with your, your, and John can talk to this more, but if you have a contract that's performance-based, uh, you don't need the extra salt down. Um, and uh, you know, so I think this really, you know, this, like I said, this is going to impact the commercial uh, real estate industry, but I think for the better. And part of what we're trying to do is empower all the entities, all the different parties uh, to uh, uh, make this a benefit to them. Um, and so I think that's part of it. Um, it's even, you know, starting before the storm, you know, if you are a contractor, you know, look at the property you're going to be working on. Find those places that have uh, drainage, uh, and that, you know, if you've got drainage areas, that's going to possibly uh, create ice events after ice event after ice event. So you're going to have to be reapplying things. If you can uh, make adjustments uh, to prevent that type of drainage, you're uh, reducing your workload, and then you're also reducing the amount of salt that you uh, put down. You know, so there are a lot of things that uh, go into this that is not just liquids or you know the higher tech things. A lot of this is just real practical things that people may not think about uh, uh, until they re you know really start to understand you know how uh, much of a consequence these materials that we're putting down have. Um, so mm -hmm. it, you know, as far as anything else that you would want to elaborate on, as far as uh, uh, like the commercial real estate industry and you know. So we would definitely like to get feedback from folks about, you know, if we're going to work on developing, um, you know, a, a shortened training course kind of a thing, or you know, really, I'm, I kind of see it as like a breakfast <laughs> and come for 45 minutes and you know, kind of go through the training and probably have a very shortened uh, manual or pamphlet of information. Definitely like to get feedback from folks about what would be useful. Uh, to have included in that and how we can uh, make a training like this that has value uh, to whoever's attending, particularly if they're looking for continuing education credits or things like that. So really trying to make use of your time uh, in the most efficient way, help us get our message out there and support the, the work of the 
contractors who are implementing these practices, uh, but also provide you some other benefits as well. Yeah, so if you have thoughts, Neely, uh, you know, please uh, you know, reach out to me or you've got uh, Jennifer's contact information. You know, uh, we want to be making sure that what we're creating here has value uh, to the contractors that are going to be using it uh, and uh, all the other entities that are going to be part of this. Um, and uh, you know, we've been collecting photos and things like this uh, and you know, there are so many examples of salt that's put down on parking lots and sidewalks that is just uh, a nuisance. Uh, if you are tracking salt, uh, like solid material, into a store, uh, that linoleum floor uh, becomes a major slip hazard. Uh, so, you know, more is not better uh, in any way, shape, or form. Uh, so, if safety is your concern, using liquids and all these other things have, t you know, multiple benefits on top of uh, reduced chlorides. Mm -hmm. um, when we first started working on this, uh, I was talking to uh, all kinds of contractors and spoke to a lot of the larger contractors. Uh, and that year we were in the middle of a sh salt shortage. Uh, the municipalities have first dibs, so they really weren't dealing with the shortage, but all the private contractors were. So one of the contractors I was working with was actually getting ready to go to Egypt to talk directly to the Egyptian government to buy salt directly from Egypt, which is then going to be transported, uh, you know, uh, across the world. Uh, so you know, being able to use liquids and use less salt has major uh, uh, benefits uh, from a uh, business standpoint when you're looking at it from that perspective. Uh, and then we'll have John talk more about the business end of things. Mm -hmm. Anything else you want to cover? No, I think. Any other questions uh, for Jennifer? Okay, thank yeah. you, Jennifer. Thank you. Okay, and so uh, you know, we are not, we've not entered into this working in a vacuum. We really have tried to work with the, uh, the partners that would be uh, implementing this and uh, taking the training. And uh, uh, fortunately, we've got a, a contractor right here in Woodstock who really has uh, been a leader in, in uh, adopting liquids and sensible salting and has been part of our, our, our group. Uh, so John Langton, why don't you come on up here? Uh, I've known John for many years, uh, but... Uh, I became aware of his uh, the work that he was doing uh, when I attended a uh, what was it uh, summer uh, summer field days yeah summer field days and uh, one of the contractors that was part of our program uh, actually he, his company is uh, sell salt and he's uh, one of the biggest advocates for sensible salting um, and uh, he was saying one of the greatest contractors is uh, you know right up in Woodstock and sure enough it's actually my neighbor um, so. Uh, uh, you know, I, I've known John for several years and kind of watched the evolution to a certain degree. Uh, he actually does the work here at, at the county administration building. And uh, it was kind of funny. I, you know, I'm a sen sensible salting guy. So, I, you know, I'm like, we've got to be sensible salting you know, here, here at our building. You know, we've got to practice what we preach. And so I'm beating the hell out of our facilities guy saying, we need to do this. We need to do this. And then our safety guy is like, why don't you have more salt out there? So the poor facilities guy guy is just getting beat up from both ways. Uh, but eventually we were able to integrate uh, liquids and anti-icing into our routine. And so now you will see the striping on our parking lot when you come here in the winter time. And uh, John is responsible for that. Um, now you don't have a, a, a formal presentation, but you want to go off the cuff of about just kind of tell your the evolution of how you uh, got into liquids and uh, sensible salting and how it's been be, uh, integrated into your business practices. Sure. So I'm pretty good. Uh, if, if everybody can hear me, I'll. Well, pass this is this is for our okay. uh, recording. All right. I'm gonna say I'm pretty loud. I am too. But it's for the recording. If you don't mind. All right. Cool. Perfect. Thank you. All right. Uh, so, yep. My name is John Langton. I'm uh, one of the owners of uh, of Langton Group. I've been in business since 2005. Um, we do private parking lots, uh, city roads, governmental parking lots, a um, couple HOAs, that's kind of an area we kind of stray away from, um, but um, have a lot of experience with you know, the icing, plowing, all that fun stuff. So for me to tailor my conversation around sensible salt 
to my audience. Um, municipalities in here, do we, I heard commercial property managers, any private contractors? No, um, so park districts, cities, anything else I'm missing? Schools. Schools, okay. Um, all right, so uh, we do work for schools as well. So in, in we'll go to schools. Uh, most of the time, your contractor or most, you know, maybe your staff as well, you like to be done before buses start arriving, 6 a.m. Um, you want to get, you know, your contractor off the site. It's a great thing for liquids. Um, we all know our weather forecasting. Uh, we use a couple private forecasters. Um, sometimes the weather is just that. It, it kind of strays away from the forecast. So. The nice thing with, with using a liquid uh, de-icer as an anti-ice or pre-treatment is you can get out ahead of the storm, um, almost schedule your staff. Everyone knows there's, I'm sure we're all dealing with labor issues just at different levels. You can kind of schedule your staff, um, get ahead of it, keep your grounds and uh, crew happy, keep everyone safe, keep your superintendent happy because you got some service down before you had head traffic. Um, so that, that's kind of one of the benefits. So uh, how did we get started in liquids? Um, 2005, we incorporated. We got into liquids. Uh, Tony Johnson of Midwest Salt um, helped us try to use some different uh, blends. Um, product uh, magnesium chloride blend with calcium and salt brine. Um, we bought it in 275 gallon totes, put it in the back of a truck, pretty simple. Um, uh, liquid de-ice uh, sprayer, about $2,500, simple, it had a motor, had a pressure gauge, uh, it's a pretty simple bar with nozzles attached to it with rubber hosing, and you set the pressure, set the speed of, the, of you know, whether 5, 10 miles an hour, and we applied liquid de-icer. Um, biggest struggle at that point was, okay, how do we sell this to our customers? Um, from a financial side of it because the cost to do that out you know, was, was more expensive than just putting down granular salt. So then you go and you try to say, okay, let's get some benefits of um, you know, um, you know, the environment, tracking into facilities, stores. Uh, we we kind of specialize in big box retail. Um, Janitor, you know, janitorial fees, stuff like that. And we put it down um, on a newly sealed parking lot and had adverse reactions. Um, it was a fresh seal coated parking lot and I get a call from our customer, uh, which was a retailer and said, hey, our parking lot is like a sheet of ice. And I laughed and said, that's impossible. It's 39 degrees. They said, you need to come out here. So we went out, looked, there were parts that were kind of slick. Um, so we kind of took, a, a, honestly, a year or two back because for a lack of better reasoning, it, it scared us, right? Uh, a lot of liability. Uh, we put down a product. Um, didn't have a ton of experience with it. Um, Tony did great advising us. And what we did wrong was um, we applied it. The next day it warmed up. And because the calcium in it attracted moisture, that had an adverse reaction with the seal coating. So about 2016, 2015 or 2016, I actually went to a SnowX uh, demonstration. They were trying to sell us equipment, to be honest, and uh, sat in a brine maker um, presentation. And they discussed with us why we should just use straight salt brine. Um, and it made sense to me. Most of the time in our area, um, you know, northern Illinois, our pavement temps in most storms are 20 degrees or warmer. So that is when salt is still very effective. It's also the most, uh, you know, technically cost effective uh, means to melt and prevent ice. Um, so we bought our first brine maker and went out and uh, still use just the non-GPS units. The, I'm going to call them the, the custom home built kind of fabricating out of a shop like like you had said and we got ourselves a snow x gps uh, 300 gallon uh, uh, sprayer which is actually on one of the trucks that i'm going to you know demonstrate with today um, 
We picked five customers. The route was in Huntley, Illinois, uh, consisted of some banks, a private road that led to, um, you know, like an Aldi, um, you know, like just small little parking lots, private road, and then also a dental facility. We did not tell the customers anything about it. Our contract specifically said we would use a de-icer to de-ice their parking lots. Um, at the end of the year, I personally, uh, important to know, I personally was the one that, that actually spread it. Um, that was important for us to get real measurements, um, know when we had to do it, and it maybe wasn't the most cost effective or time effective, but to get data so that we could scale it in our operation. Um, that year, I believe we had 34 events. Um, we classify an event anytime we have to plow or de-ice. Uh, 34 events. Of the 34 events, 32 of the events we were able to use um, brine as uh, pre and post treat. Um, probably about four of the events we did mix calcium in. Um, the only real reason we mix calcium in is to protect our equipment. Um, salt brine at 23.3. Uh, will not freeze, it's eutectic temperature, uh, which is a fancy word for freeze point, is negative six. Um, but of that, you know, great results um, allowed us to get pretty much our, our low end and our high end of what was needed in um, anti-ice, um, post-treatment before uh, or, or after a plow, and sometimes you know post-treatment of a quarter of an inch of snow that we just, honestly, we, we took care of it with, uh, with salt brine on a direct application. Um, at the end of the season, I talked to those customers and said, hey, how was service this year? Do you think it was the same, increased, decreased? Um, did, you notice any, uh, did you notice a cleaner site, more dirty site? Uh, how was your interior cleanliness? And those were the first series of questions. Um, most, some people said they noticed no difference. Some, uh, two of the the five uh, customers said they noticed um, a cleaner facility, um, and actually one of them actually said safer. They felt like their lot was good the whole year. Um, and out of all five that we pulled, none of them wanted to go back the other way. Okay, they're still using it today um, in, in some private sites in Huntley. So that was kind of our initial beta test, so to speak. And from there, uh, we rolled it out. Last year, we used 80,000 gallons of, of brine. Uh, for direct um, anti-ice and, and post-treatment. Um, we do make our own brine in-house. We use a SnowX uh, machine. Um, if you're going to make 80,000 gallons, I would not recommend a SnowX machine. I actually don't think they make it anymore. Um, not sure if I can promote somebody or not, but whoever's doing the loan program, a company called VSI, um, they actually just partnered with Boss. They actually make a great brine maker. Um, I don't have it yet, but that's probably the direction uh, we would go. Um, I think someone over here said they're buying brine this year for 82 cents. Um, doesn't sound off to me. Um, I haven't recalculated this year's based on the price of salt and whatever electricity went up. Um, we don't use a ton of labor because our machine is somewhat automated. Um, the most labor we have is we have our brine farm that isn't exactly connected perfectly, so sometimes we have to truck it from the making facility to the brine farm. Um, but last year we were at about 22 cents a gallon is our figure for what it cost us to make brine. Okay. Um, if without knowing your electric cost or your labor cost, I would imagine people know what their labor cost is, fully burdened. Um, then your water cost, whether you're pulling from your own well or you're pulling from, if you're maybe paying city water. Um, I guess I doubt most of you are not paying for city water. Um, but mostly it's, it's your salt cost. So in a gallon of, of salt brine at 23.3, uh, you have 2.3 pounds per gallon. Okay. So that's kind of our story um, on the liquids. Um, I will ask a question and then I'll open it up to questions so we have enough time to do a demonstration and anything else Scott would like to add. Um, you know, how many of you are 
actually going out in the field and applying salt um, in a truck. Okay, um, so the rest of you then are telling an employee or a team member um, to go and apply uh, rock salt. You're kind of directing your maybe more management level. Yeah, okay. So if you, now again, I, I do more parking lots than, than roads. I know you guys do pounds per lane mile. We do pounds or tons per acre, okay. Um, do you think any of your granular equipment can apply um, can apply rock salt at 92 pounds per acre? I don't know what that equivalents out into lane miles, but I actually think it's a, it would actually be less, not more. Um, can anybody say they can do that with a granular setup? I see a couple couple no's. Anybody say yes? All right. So we anti-ice at 40 gallons per acre, which is, I'm gonna guess and probably say about 50 gallons per lane mile. Um, at that calculation, we are applying 92 pounds of rock salt per acre. Um, most settings, even on the newest, most high, you know, brand new electric, hydraulic, whatever you're running, gas powered, um, bulk salt spreader, it's pretty hard to get much below 250 um, and actually have even coverage. Um, so that was kind of our, just made perfect sense. Obviously we are a for-profit business. Um, my three columns in winter that are most expensive, labor, fuel, and salt. Okay, so if we can save on salt, Typically, we also save on labor by anti-icing. We can schedule things. And um, the fuel part is, that one's up for debate because sometimes you're doing an extra service, but you're able to increase safety and use less, you know, rock salt. So anybody have any questions on anything? Um, go ahead, Chuck. Um, how long will the salt stay in there? And I mean, do you have to have a 24 hour window with all the storms coming? then go out and pre-salt? Yep, uh, that's a good question. So, you know, for us, we like to keep it 48 hours or less. Um, have I seen us anti-ice and a storm completely duds out and it's there four days later? Yes. Um, if you get into the time of spring where you have kind of the freeze, th you know, I don't want to say freeze thaws, but almost where the, where the asphalt or concrete is sweating, um, yeah, you might get a little bit of dilution or it just kind of spreads it out. Um, but you know, I would say as long as there's no precipitation or no rain in the forecast, yeah, you can go out two days, three days. You know, we, we, again, we like to keep it 48 hours and under, but um, you can go out and, and treat. Um, one advantage to that, um, being a road, um, if, you have, uh, if you're a commercial real estate owner or property manager, it allows your, you know, either your operation or your snow removal contractor to do these things in the middle of the night pre-scheduled when the roads are empty, free of snow and ice, open parking lots, so we can actually get de-icer, anti-icer, uh, look pretty much brine app applied onto your pavement where we can't with granular if we're doing a, a pre-treatment during the day typically, you can't get it in between those cars. So it also gets it underneath the cars without getting it underneath the cars. Um, but good question. Well, that's, that definitely seems to be a performance benefit uh, to uh, liquid Yes, icing. yes. That, icing. Yep, I mean, you have that performance benefit. You have the ability to, um, in theory, get more work done with less employees. On the private side, I know municipally, it's a little bit different. Um, you guys typically, I, I think, with the exception of your seasonal employees, kind of are, are get, you're more guaranteed the 40 hour work week, so to speak. Um, for the private side, um, it allows us to get our employees and keep the same employees because they're actually making a living and it's not extra money. Um, so you get a little bit more vested employee. Uh, I guess for the municipality side, you're actually 
you know, putting them to work on something that is a saving money, saving infrastructure, good for the environment, um, and, and it's more kind of directly helping your snow and ice operation for the upcoming storm. So, any other questions? You didn't mention them, but what I, one of the things I've noticed is we've been doing it for a few years is when, when we're done with the push, we have a push and after we've done a pre-treatment, it's wet. Yep, well, depending on the time of year, for sure. You're putting granular down, you're waiting an hour or two and get it down to bare pavement, and when, sometimes if it's right, you get, it's wet already. Right. Yep, that's a great point. You're 100% right. I mean, um, you know, pre-treating is kind of like spraying Pam in your frying pan. Um, before you put an egg down. Um, it, it just makes things blade off a little bit easier, a little bit better traction um, when you're plowing. Um, there's times, especially in beginning of season and more so I feel like end of season, so February snowfalls, March snowfalls, shoot, sometimes April snowfalls. Um, you know, you're, you're putting that down, you plow, and then the, yeah, the rest melts off and if it's if the snow ended at 2 a.m. and you have a completely cleared parking lot, sometimes you don't even have to put, put anything back down. Um, or you can just go through and do your 40 or 35, whatever that number is that works for you and your you know, organization or uh, entity. Um, you know, that's what I would recommend. And, and, you know, I would also say the biggest thing is just kind of retest, right? So maybe 40 gallons is what we use today. That doesn't mean that in, in our, our new preseason snow meeting um, that we have for our staff um, that we don't tweak things down. Um, on the granular side, I know we're talking a ton about liquids, but I think the general message is use less de-icers. Um, uh, in 2014, we hired a management company. Uh, we were growing rapidly. We've been a top 100 snow company um, in the nation based by a magazine, ASCA. And um, we're growing, right? And we honestly weren't making money. Um, so we said, well, what are we doing wrong? And one of the things we were doing wrong is A, over applying de icer, and B, not really having a gauge of here's our baseline and if there's uh, we have upwards of 200 employees so if one employee is putting down a ton and a half per acre they're not thankfully and another employee is putting down a hundred pounds per acre a we're gonna have some real liability issues and B I'm I'm losing the, the customer that maybe I'm only putting down a hundred per acre um, and I'm also losing the customer that I'm putting down that much and losing money on them. So it allowed us to get a baseline and then we set based off of measurements. Um, and our coating of salting, whether it's uh, a brine application or a granule application, is coated from a management uh, you know, staff level. Um, and I can explain how that happens. So uh, we have uh, two private forecasters. Um, to give us what the snow is supposed to do, air, uh, air temp, pavement temp, you know, all those uh, fun, fun things, when it's supposed to start. Um, and from that, we decide if, you know, um, starting air temp, ending air temp, ending air temp, pavement, and then winds, and that helps us determine how much we're gonna go out. So, so we coat our saltings uh, up until last year. We had three coatings. This year we put it, or last year we beta tested on a few routes a fourth, which is lighter, not heavier, and um, it's actually rolled out fully into our, our salting program this year that we have the, have the fourth. Um, and the fourth dropped it from the next lowest by about 25%. Um, so we, are, we have some granular applications that are down um, to about 148 pounds per acre. Um, so we don't use them all the time. Obviously we try to code right. We don't want callbacks. We don't want slip and falls. Um, but we're trying to work that number down. Um, and that's, you know, for, for a lot of reasons. Um, when we initially rolled that out, uh, a lot of our employees were like, hey, no way is, you know, this was, you know, six years ago. So we'll, we'll keep the keep the lower end number down, but you know, let's say they were putting 600 pounds down per acre. Like, there's no way it's gonna work. Like, give it time, 
uh, we have a, we have a couple different test lots that we use. Um, a few at our own facility, asphalt, sealed asphalt, concrete, a bridge um, so that we could get the elevation that people might get on bridges and then we test it with that application. Um, then we have an area that gets traffic and we have an area that gets no traffic. And then we can take pictures, we have pre-event, pre post-event, we put in a file, that's kind of a liability side as well, um, that we do that for ourselves. Um, and we said, hey, go run the rest of your route we'll let you go back and look on your way back. If you go back and look and it needs it, we'll load you up, but we need to check your calibration of your spreader. We need to, you know, maybe you should have plowed, you know, something might be wrong. Uh, I'm gonna say nine times out of 10, but really I don't remember a time that somebody went back and they didn't say, yep, I need to come reload, it needs more, because usually in an hour, the job's done. So, um, you know, that's, that's what we've done with it. Um, we were about 30% of the size in 2015 that we are today. In 2015, we were using 5,000 tons of salt. This year, we're contracted for 3,000 tons, and I will probably not use it all. So, um, do the math right there. Um, and uh, our retention rate on our customers this year was 99%. Our, our five-year average is 97%. Um, so it's, we're obviously achieving good results with it. So, okay. Any other questions? Well, thanks. All right, you're welcome. Thank you.